Good morning, Grace Covenant. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Is anyone else besides me extremely thankful for the cooler temperatures this morning? Okay. Yes. Amen. Praise God and thank Him for that. If you would, turn to Ephesians chapter 6, please. Ephesians chapter 6. We are going to dig into the final thought of Paul in this Ephesians. Can you believe we are in the final few verses of Ephesians? Seems like we just started it, um, but it's been a few months now, um, and I'll keep saying it till we switch over, but the next book we're going to tackle as a body is the book of Mark. So if you would like to get commentaries, get books, study, read through it, I would highly encourage you to be prepared to um, be taught by the Spirit during those weeks as we move through the Gospel of Mark together. That will pro probably start sometime in the mid to late October, somewhere around in that time. So just keep that in mind. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 12, 10 through 12 is what we're going to read together today and study together and, and see the beauty of Christ together today. So if you would, stand with me in honor of the one who gave us this word as we read his words together, uh, and then we will pray and, and dig into this amazing passage. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 reads, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might of his strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather as a body here to worship you. Thank you for the edification that it is to hear the saints sing loudly in praise to you. Uh, I pray that you will be worshipped, um, that we will focus on your glory today uh, during the, the preaching of the word, um, that we will be impacted through the strength and power of your spirit by the words that you have gifted us. I pray that you will remove any hindrances from me and that you will help the words to be spoken clearly and more importantly, most importantly, accurately according to the intentions of the word that you've given us. We glorify you and praise you in your holy name. Amen. All right, you can be seated. So the, the title of the text today, or title of the sermon today, excuse me, is The Unseen War. The Unseen War. And I want you to start by picturing Wartburg Castle in Germany. Um big dark castle in the 1500s, just think about it for just a minute, and picture that today we're taking a tour of it. We're going to go to Wartburg Castle. And while we're on this tour, we happen into this room, it's an upper room, kind of off by itself, and suddenly the tour guide stops and says, look, do you see the spots on the wall? And you look and there's little dark spots on the wall. And he goes, that is ink from Martin Luther's pen. And he begins to tell a story, and he begins to explain that Martin Luther, while translating the New Testament into German for the common people, actually was so impacted, felt so attacked and, and oppressed by Satan himself that he felt he was physically in the room, and those ink spots are from him, from his own account, whipping his ink bottle across the room to drive Satan out of the room to leave him alone. Now, when we think about that, we go, surely not. Surely the great Martin Luther didn't think that, right? He's the reformer, right? We, we, don't, we don't find hidden, we're reformed. We don't find hidden demons under every flat tire and behind every broken pencil as you're trying to write or whatever the case may be. Well, what I would say is that we, as a whole, in the reformed belief system, Reformed theology, has a tendency to overcorrect against charismatic influences or against those who would say, I can bind Satan on every corner or every Sunday. I, my question always is, when you bind Satan, why are you letting him loose? Like, you have to bind him every Sunday. What, what is that? Okay. In an, in an attempt to overcorrect from that, the Reformed theology community, Reformed community has, unfortunately, in my opinion, often overcorrected to where we completely ignore or won't acknowledge the fact that there is a hidden war and that there truly is something more that we're against beyond what we can actually see. And the, the idea of, of me opening with the story of Martin Luther is, is the man who is called the, the, 
the fire that started the Reformation, right? When he banged that 95 Thesis on the door of Wittenberg Castle, he started something he never intended to start. Never intended to start. And yet God used that and, and exploded Reformed theology of focus back to justification by faith alone, Scripture alone. But in that, he himself encountered so vividly the oppression and the attack of Satan himself that he thought he could run him out of a room with a bottle of ink. So I want us to, to think about that whenever we're studying today's text, because there is, in fact, an unseen war. There are things going on around us that we cannot see, but we can feel. That we cannot see, but we are impacted by. And there are things that happen in our world today that have no explanation outside of there's something negative going on there. The depravity that we see has to have more than, than just, there's, there's supernatural things happening and we don't really have a lot of explanations for it outside of that's probably demonic, right? And so we need to acknowledge that. So as we, as we begin to tackle this last thought of, of Paul in Ephesians here, this last section, he is essentially culminating this letter to the whole church. So I want us to keep that in mind. The letter of Ephesians is to the whole church as a whole. But he is wanting to culminate everything he's taught us up to this point in application. That's essentially what he is doing. Is He is taking, and, and we're going to look through it today, we're going to look at so many points throughout the book of Ephesians where he's referencing now, because of these things I've just taught you, here's how you stand. Because of these things that we are in Christ, here's how you put on the armor of God. Because of Christ himself, and again, we're going to look through all that this is how we stand in a fallen world because this fallen world is in a battle. Whether we want to admit it or not, whether we can see it or not, we are truly in a battle. And so as Paul has spent his time telling us who we are in Christ and in these things, he, he now switches gears into an analogy of Roman guards. I want us to put aside, please put aside, the idea of the medieval suit of armor as the armor of God. That is not at all what Paul is referencing. It wasn't even invented yet. Okay? Please, it's, it's, it's cool to look at. I, I totally agree. I like medieval armor just as much as the next guy. That's not what the text is about. The text is about a Roman soldier. And in fact, not just a Roman soldier. It's talking in the unit. There's plurals throughout this text that tell us he is not talking about an individual taking up an individual piece of armor and putting it on to go fight hand-in-hand -hand combat with Satan himself. The church is who he is talking about. The plural here is the, the united body of Christ, standing in Christ, being able to stand firm against Satan himself. Another aspect I want you to keep in mind as we go through this text here is that armor in the time of Paul was seen as a status symbol. The status rank that was indicated by the armor demanded a level of honor and respect. So we need to understand as we're reading through this, as believers in Christ being given the armor of God, who is Christ, the privilege of wearing that armor should not be missed. It cannot be missed because we truly are dressed in Christ. So let's, let's keep that in mind. The, the, the short little quote here that I have, I came across this week and I really think it sets us up as we begin to get into the meat of the text this morning. Our passage in Ephesians might pick up on the notion of battling ideas, values, and ultimate good. However, believers face the enemy as a group, not as one individual against another individual. In Ephesians, the warfare is real, but not literal. The armor is, our, is authentic, but not physical. So keep that as just a really good preface to what we're going to talk about today, okay? So as we begin to tackle through here, I'd like to start with point number one, strength in the Lord. We're going to look at verse 10 to begin. Strength in the Lord. Verse 10 reads, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the might of his strength. Finally is an okay translation of that word, but truly the, the best appropriate translation of that first word in, in verse 10 is henceforth. Henceforth. It carries the idea of everything that based upon everything that I've told you henceforth going forward from now on, this is who you are. So everything I've just taught, and if you guys recall, everything that Paul has just taught us in chapters 1 through 5 is who you are in Christ and how to live like it, right? That's a, a very high level overview, but that's essentially what he's taught us. And so henceforth, the final point of this letter is 
Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. 1 John 4.4 4 echoes something very, very similar. When John wrote this letter, he said, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the Lord. So the makeup of what Paul was doing is, if you recall, he kind of started with negatives most often whenever he was teaching what to not do and then what to do. You guys remember that? We were going through, don't do this, but do this. Don't. So he starts with a negative and then comes in with a positive. He reverses roles here for us, his, his writing style, and he gives us the positive first. Be strong in the Lord because of what's to come. Be strong in the Lord because of the invisible, unseen forces that we fight against. So he's establishing confidence in the reader's of this epistle, that God is strong. But notice the language that he uses in the last part of the verse. And in the might of his strength. Now I mentioned earlier that the armor of God is Christ himself. But if you look through the rest of this passage and you read it, it's, it's, it doesn't say the armor of God is Christ himself. Well, Paul didn't have to write it because he's already said it. Okay, He said this not only in Ephesians earlier on, but he's also said it in other books. So we're going to look at that together. So Romans chapter 1, flip back over there for me if you would. Romans chapter 1, 15 through 21, verses 15 through 21. So just a few pages back, we're going to bring up chapter 1. And this is a very popular writing style in Greek where you start with an idea and then you close with the idea and everything in between it substantiates that idea. So he's bringing up the same exact phrasing that he had earlier in the letter because he's bringing to mind what was already said. So Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 21 reads, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which is, exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom, and of revelation in the full knowledge of him, so that you, the eyes of your heart having been enlightened, will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of the might of his strength, which he worked in Christ, by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, and authority, and power, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So he uses the exact same word, or phrasing. He says, according to the working of the might of his strength, and then explains what that might is, which he worked in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So the power, the might that we are told in chapter 6 and verse 10 to stand in is the, the redemptive power of God. It's the plan of redemption culminating in Christ's resurrection and him being placed at the right hand of a holy God. That is some powerful might. The God himself culminated redemption through the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. And so when we understand that Paul is referencing what he's talking about in chapter 1, we can see in the very same book, Paul elaborated in chapter 1 in these verses exactly what that might of his strength is. We know that Paul is telling the church of Ephesians to be strong in the salvation of God. Be strong in your redemption. Be strong in what God has done in and through Christ alone for you. We are to stand in the might of his strength and the redemptive plan. Because this is the self-same mighty strength that we have to stand against Satan. Think about that. The same mighty strength that raised Christ from the dead, from the dead, that's a, that's a big deal, okay? Who raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of God ascended into heaven to the throne room of God himself and seated him at the seat of power for almighty Yahweh, that same power is what we are clothed in through redemption, clothed in being united with Christ, and that is what we stand strong in against these evil forces that we cannot see. That is phenomenal. 
Because the power that does these changes is what Paul has talked about throughout the book of Ephesians. Because this isn't about a vitamin or an energy boost, right? I've heard the armor of God preached where if you get up and you, you, you know, every day you pray for a different piece of the armor. and you, That's not what this is about. The armor is a unit. This armor that God is talking about here, that, that Paul is talking about here through uh, the, the inspiration of the Spirit, is talking about the overall unit of protection we have, which is namely Christ himself. Christ himself. So think about this. I'm going to give you a breakdown. If you're a note taker, write fast. I'll talk slow, but write fast. Okay? So there's going to be things that we once were and things that we now are. This is through the power. You ready? We were dead, Ephesians 2, 1. Now we're alive, chapter 2 and verse 5. So we were dead, 2, 1. We're alive, 2, 5. We were under the dominion of Satan, 2-2. Two, two. Under the dominion of Satan, chapter 2, verse 2. These are all in Ephesians, by the way. And then, we were, then now we are seated in heavenly realms, chapter 2 and verse 6. So we were under the dominion of Satan, 2-2. Two, two. Seated in heavenly realms, 2-6. We were objects of wrath, 2-3. We were objects of wrath, chapter 2 and verse Three. Now we are his glorious inheritance, chapter 1 and verse 18. So we were objects of wrath, 2, 3. We are his glorious inheritance, 1, 18. We were separate, 2, 12. We were separate, 2, 12. Now we are brought near, 2, 13. We were foreigners, 219. Now we are fellow citizens, 219. That same verse, we were aliens, 219. Now we are household members, chapter 2 and verse 19. Household members. We were denied gospel mystery. Chapter 3 and verse 5. Now we are understanding gospel mystery. Chapter 3 and verse 4. We were infants. Chapter 4 and verse 14. Now we are maturing in Christ. Chapter 4 and verse 15. I'll read that one again. We were infants. Chapter 4 and verse 14. Now we're maturing in Christ, chapter 4 and verse 15. We're almost there. We were an old self, chapter 4 and verse 22. Now, by God's grace, we are a new self, chapter 4 and verse 24. And finally, we were darkness, chapter 5 and verse 8. And now we are light, chapter 5. And verse 8. Do you think Paul is trying to get us to understand that we are not what we once were? Do you think Paul is trying to get us to understand by, by the might of God? Because that's what he starts with in chapter 1, isn't it? We just read that after the, his opening remarks of chapter 1, he tells us by the might of the power that he displayed in resurrecting Christ, we are all these things. We are no longer what we were. We are what we are now in Christ. And now he comes to the end here and he says, because of that same strength, be strong in the Lord. We cannot be strong in ourselves. Because if we could do it ourselves, we would still be what we were. Right? We can't do it ourselves because if we, if we, we can't do it ourselves because we would still be what we were if it weren't for Christ. Oh, that was a lot of tongue twisting. I apologize. So let me try that again. If we could do it ourselves, we, we cannot do it ourselves because we would still be who we were. All that list. Look on the left side of your column if you took notes. Okay. Because of Christ, we now are what we are in him. And it is only in him that we can stand. It's been said life in this often hostile world requires endurance and strength, but not the kind we give ourselves. 
Rather, to resist at a spiritual level requires the strength supplied by God rooted in his might. So our application, the first point is, be strong in the Lord because of what Christ has done. We cannot be strong in ourselves. This is not a call for you to do something different in your lives. It's for you to understand that you are already strong in the Lord because what Christ has done, live like it. Right? All the Ephesians we've talked about, looking at what Christ has done, resting in what he has done from chapters 1 through 3 to live out chapters 4 through 5, 4 through 6. Because we are not drawn to the place where we live out in appreciation and gratitude and thankfulness for what he's done without recognizing what he's done in us. You have to rest in what Christ has done to understand that you are living and truly standing in his power. Do not look to your own power. Point number two, stand firm. Stand firm, verse 11. It reads, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The word here for full armor is the Greek word panoply, P-A-N-O-P-L-Y, panoply. And that means complete collection. So when it refers to something, it is the complete collection of something. It is the absolute complete set. This armor is to be seen as a unit. Again, I'm I'm going to push back pretty heavily because growing up, I heard all these sermons about the armor of God and all these things that you as a Christian had to do to get these pieces of armor to work and fit them all together and to make sure that you were there to protect yourself from Satan. You cannot protect yourself from Satan or you wouldn't have been his child in the first place. Only Christ protects you from Satan. Only the helmet of salvation found in Christ and who he is protects you from... I'm going to preach the next two weeks' sermons if I don't stop. So, we will get there, okay? But understand, understand this is talking about the unit of armor as a whole. Get out of your mind the idea of these individual pieces. He uses that as a description because he's used to seeing Roman soldiers. Guess what the Ephesians were used to seeing all the time? Roman soldiers. Guess what perfect word picture it is for him to describe this? Roman soldier suit of armor. It's just That's just the analogy that he uses to describe what Christ does for us. So get that really firmly in your minds because we need to, to get away from the idea of all these bits and pieces. Christ is whole, he is perfect, and he's completed redemption entirely. And I want to show you that Christ is truly the armor that he's talking about. Lest I haven't done that so far, let me have you turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verses 12 through 14. Christ himself here is described as the armor. Paul also wrote Romans, so we know his thought processes here. We can often take from other epistles that an apostle wrote to help understand things in his other epistles and, and really look at that together. And so this is a good example of how Scripture interprets Scripture so we can understand the ideas that are being communicated. So Romans chapter 13, verses 12 through 14, it reads, The night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Keep that in mind. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So Paul uses the same terminology for armor of light and put on Lord Jesus Christ. He uses them both to describe the same act. In Paul's mind, the armor of the believer is Christ himself. It's undoubtedly what he's trying to communicate. And that is what we look at to stand firm. That is what we understand that God has graciously united us, that we are united with Christ in such a manner that we are standing as though he is standing for us that we stand against the evil one, that we can stand firm because of what Christ has done, not because of what you can do. 
The only way to stand against the devil is in Christ. James and Peter both mention standing and fleeing the devil respectively. Paul mentions standing against the devil multiple times. But nowhere in the New Testament, in any epistle, does it say that we can defeat Satan. Nowhere does it say that. There is only one who can defeat Satan, and that is Yahweh himself. In fact, in Jude, Michael, what I would argue is the the most powerful angel described in Scripture, says he himself will not stand against Satan himself over the body of Moses. That is the enemy that we stand against. And I'm not saying that he has power over over us in a way that that he can possess us and those kinds of things. I'm not trying to scare you or or trying to get you to to, uh, live defeated lives. What I'm trying to get you to understand is the only power that can stand against him is Christ. That is it. That our enemy is strong, our enemy is conniving, our enemy is intelligent, he schemes, he knows what he's doing to trip us up. If, if you haven't read Screwtape Letters, I highly recommend it. It's by C.S. Lewis. It's not, it's non, it is a, a fiction, it is not non-fiction, but it, <laughs> it is fiction, okay, there we go. My words are, I'm struggling today, guys. It is a fiction, okay? But the way that C.S. Lewis uses the phenomenal mind that God gave him to describe the, the conversation between Wormwood and his uncle is phenomenal. And it gives you insights into how the, 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 the demonic might operate. I'm not saying it's canon. I'm not saying it's from Scripture. All I'm saying is it gets your mind thinking. But when we understand the power of our enemy, we have to rely on Christ himself. And that is it. We do not have the power to stop him. We don't. Because if we did, we wouldn't have still been his children. That's what I was trying to say earlier. You see how much better that came out? Okay. And I know it sounds like I'm beating a dead horse, but I'm trying to get us to rest in what Christ has done. I'm trying to get us to rest and rely on him. For it is his power and his grace and his mercy. We are clothed in Christ himself. That is a phenomenal thing to think about. Because Paul references this same thing earlier in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at verse 7, and then we're going to look at 11 through 16. Because he tells us the means by which he helps us stand against the scheming. Because Satan does scheme. That's the last part of verse 11. We must stand firm against the schemes of the devil. But Paul has already told us how that works out. Let's look at it. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 first, it says, But to each one of us grace was given, given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So now he's going to talk about the gifts of the saints in the local body. Because remember, Ephesians is written to the church as a whole. Ephesians four eleven through 16 reads, And he himself gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the full knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, so that we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body being joined and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the properly measured working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So God has already provided us the means, the very means by which we will take those stands against the schemings of the devil. The church. Do you see how this all works together? Paul is writing to the church, telling the church that you're no longer who you were before, telling you this is how you stand, giving us the very means by which we then grow because he gives everybody gifting. And then he comes in the chapter and goes, now that you're gifting each other and you're growing and you're standing against the schemes of the devil, put on Christ. Christ is who this is found in. Stand firm. 
It's almost like a dumb moment. Paul goes, all this stuff I've told you, here you go, stand firm. But over and over, I've heard this text preached as this laborious weight that goes on my shoulder that I'm responsible for doing all these things to make sure I have each individual piece of the armor put on when Christ has completed it. Rest in Him. Stand in Him. Be confident in His victory because He says He will bring that forward. He will bring that to culmination. So look to one another as the body of Christ. Look to the strengths that he has given, the gifting that he has given to the brothers and sisters around you, and understand that he has given you that gift, or excuse me, given them that gift to help you grow in Christ. He has already not only given the command, but the means by which he will bring that to fruition in our lives. And not only does Paul give us the idea here that in chapter 4 of, of what it looks like to grow and the means by which he gives us that, he actually tells us and uses an example of what can give Satan an opportunity to scheme. Do you know he even gives us an example of that? Chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning too. Chapter 4, verses 26 and 27 reads, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. He even talks about the disunity that comes with anger, how how the church comes together and a simple anger issue, the sun going down on your wrath, holding on to resentment, being spiteful, can give the devil an opportunity for his schemes to come to fruition. So Paul has done a very thorough job of explaining how we are going to stand in Christ, in the armor that is Christ. And the application from this second point is simple. Our ability to stand firm has nothing to do with us. It cannot be done in our own power. It is by resting in Christ, relying on His power. Now, that does not mean that you go live in ways and put yourself in ways and automatically go do things and and put yourself in situations where you'll be tempted to sin and and completely ignore. Sanctification is monergistic. God does work in you to change your desires. So please don't hear me say that we can sin so that grace may abound because that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is we have no hope in standing against the schemes of Satan and our own power. It It has nothing to do with our power. It has to do with Christ changing our desires and the Spirit living and working out in us in our daily lives. And I know that's a very complicated thing to think about, and it is. And that's why we reiterate at Grace Covenant resting in Christ. Because when your eyes are so focused on Christ, that's who you want to glorify so your decisions change. When you're so focused on Christ, you don't care that someone offended you because Christ is what's most important. When you rest in Christ and what he's done for you, your decisions and habits naturally change. You become what you view. Do you not? So when you're consuming Christ and you're focused on him and you're living in the word and you're doing those things that he's called us to do, by focusing on him, we naturally have the changes within us that he has called us to have. Think of this for just a moment as as a point of application from this point, the unity of the body and helping one another grow. When you think of modern day armies, does everyone in the unit carry the exact same loadout? Does everyone in the unit carry the same loadout? No. If you think about army maneuvers, Every member of the unit carries a specialized weapon that helps the unit function better overall, do they not? You'll see some with small close-range firearms, you'll see some with long-range, you'll see some with more powerful fast-acting, you'll see some with rocket-propelled grenades, or whatever the case may be, okay? But when you look at the unit as a whole, it functions better when everything complements each other and they can fight whatever the enemy may throw at them. You guys see where I'm going with this application? We have been given different gifts as a body. We are called, literally called here in this text, the only place in the New Testament that we are called to stand our ground in Christ as a body of believers, going to battle with Satan as Christ, as our armor. We are literally called to go to hand-to-hand combat with the evil forces. We're going to look at that in verse, next verse. 
But God has given us different weapons, if you will, different gifts that complement the unit that is our body that then stands firm against Satan. And we are promised that the gates of hell will not prevail, are we not? Remember that. We can look with confidence at our enemy, squarely in his face, respecting the power that he has, but understanding we can laugh at that power because it's nothing compared to the God that saved us. Number three, identifying the enemy. Identifying the enemy. Verse 12 reads, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That is a lot of description. The imagery here is of an intense, strong hand-to-hand battle. As I mentioned a moment ago, it's the only place in the New Testament that this imagery is used to describe the battle that we have against Satan. And just think about the, the original recipients of this letter living in Ephesus in the shadow of the temple of Artemis day in and day out. Think about the spiritual warfare that they stood against constantly, every single day. The battle for the ground of that city every single day. So with that in mind, as we tackle this last verse in our text this morning, let's begin by looking at first, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Now, please understand there are people that are used by Satan in his schemes to impact us physically, are there not? We see atrocities like abortion. We see satanic temples on the rise. We see the demonic, the truly demonic um, influence of LGBT and in, in the transgender movement and the way it's impacting families that I 100% absolutely think that it is demonic activity, Un- undoubtedly. So we see them. So how can Paul say we don't fight against flesh and blood? Because in reality, as he begins to describe the rest of these forces that we have, Paul literally gives specific authority to what's called cosmocrats. It's literally the Greek word. It's the English version. It's the transliteration. The word here for against the world forces of this darkness is cosmocrats. C-O-S-M-O-C-R-A-T-S. The Greek word is cosmokratos. And it's this idea of being in the cosmos, this almost demonic hierarchy where there are people responsible. And you can see it throughout the Old Testament. You can see the prince of the ruler of the air of this particular nation. Or the prince of the ruler was fought by Michael in this particular location. And you can see these hints at this all throughout the Old Testament. And the idea, the overall idea that Paul is getting here by using this particular word is that there are aristocratic authorities in the demonic world that is responsible for individual places and people and things. And they rule the people who are Satan's very similarly to the way that God rules his people. Now God decrees it, God allows it, he's sovereign, he's over it, he's the one in charge, don't get me wrong, okay? But the word and the description that Paul is using here in a brief study, it's not a brief study, it's an in-depth study in the Old Testament of, of these different places where, where the, the words of who was ruling and who was in authority of the powers of the air, you begin to realize that there's a little bit more going on that we can't see than maybe what we've realized before. And that although there is flesh and blood that does bring these things to our physical confrontation, our true battle is not against the people that they're using. And in fact, we should be in prayer and laboriously praying that God would convert them. But truly, what our battle was against is against the things that we cannot see. I am 100% undoubtedly confident that there are physical, demonic manifestations in our world today. Undoubtedly. If you'd like to have discussions on what particulars those are, I can give you my opinion. After... I have myself truly and honestly been impacted by what I think is physical, demonic manifestations. I have no other explanation for it. 
Now, what I want us to understand is, as scary as those are, as scary as those things that, that you see or, or come up against that you have no explanation for, my personal opinion is things like Sasquatch and aliens, those are probably demonic manifestations. I just pulling away from, from God, okay? If you, I played my hand. So that's, that's Josh's opinion, okay? I'm, I'm, I can't look to Scripture to show you that the Sasquatch is Satan, okay, or a demon, but I think outside of my weird resemblance to him, I think that's probably what it is. Okay? But what I want us to understand is I'm, I'm trying to make light of a very serious situation because if we in our humanity, if we get to focusing on it too much, we will never leave our room. If we get to focusing on how, how impactful and what happens in the world that we can't see and we can't control, our human minds will explode and we'll be debilitatingly crippled. Unless we understand that we stand in Christ. Unless we understand that he has no control. Those cosmocrats cannot control you. They can fight against you, but over and over in Scripture, God has shown his authority over those powers. Over and over we see in Scripture that we are not to be afraid of the one who runs this world. Over and over we see in Scripture, in Job, in the life of Israel, in Daniel, in all these places where the, the, it looks like the prince of the powers, the cosmocrats are going to win, God comes in and says, that is my child. How many times did Paul get shipwrecked? How many times did Paul get whipped? How many times? He got bit by a viper. That the local said, he'll be dead in a few minutes. Just let him go. And yet he shook it off in the fire and continued on because God said, that is my child. So we have to find that balance between not swinging the pendulum so far that we take it to an extreme and talk about binding Satan and he's under every flat tire and under every rock. That is not what I'm advocating for. And we can't swing the pendulum over here and think, well, we just have to ignore it. There's really not that much going on. We're just going to wait till Christ comes back and, and we'll just be fine. That's not what I'm advocating for. I'm advocating for finding the balance that Paul is saying here is that the devil is real. He's been given this cosmocratic authority by God to bring about God's will and God's pleasure and, and, and his, his wrath or whatever the case may be. You see, I can... We could talk about that for a long time, about the different ways that he uses that. Understanding that he uses that, but also having that balance of understanding we have the victory already. That we are clothed in Christ. That we are armored in him. It's complete. We're not missing anything. We don't have to bring anything from ourselves to the table. That is not what it's about. That we are staunchly standing as true, confident victors in our lives right now. Because Paul has already taught us that in Ephesians. Look at Ephesians 1.21. We've already read a portion of this, so I'll just read the final verse. But where does it say Christ? Remember when we read earlier in verse 19, I think it was, that the might has been revealed to Christ, and he was put at the right hand of God. And then Paul in verse 21 of chapter 1 says, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. That's where the authority is. In Matthew 28, in the Great Commission, Verse 18, if you back up a verse, right before he says, I'm sending you out to baptize, he says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And what we have to see is that we are now children of that king. Chapter 2, turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Let us look at what we used to be. And you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also formerly conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, 
children of wrath, even as the rest. And then verse 4, the best phrase in all of Scripture, but God. But God. We are no longer sons of disobedience. We are no longer daughters of disobedience. We are no longer children of wrath because God stepped in and said, this one is mine. So these rulers and authorities that we've had to look at, these rulers and authorities, these cosmocrats that we've looked at today, are already defeated. Colossians 2.15, that Paul wrote Colossians the same time he wrote Ephesians, listen to what he says in Colossians 2.15, that Christ, having disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them in him. The cross was a public display of the defeat of the cosmocrats. Christ put them on display. He put their defeat on display for all the world to see. And this is the very thing that Paul was called out to do, and that's what I would challenge us with as I get ready to close this last point here. Turn to Acts chapter 26, verses 14 to 18. We all know, I'm sure most of us know about Paul's Damascus conversion and that Christ appeared to him, blinded him, told him what he would do. But when you look in Acts 26, verses 14 to 18, you see Paul's description of this, and he gives a little bit more of a description here. And I thought it fit so perfectly with what he's been telling us in Ephesians. Let's begin in verse 14 of Acts 26. And when we had all fallen to the ground, so this is in reference to the Damascus Road, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a servant and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the authority of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. The greatest missionary that ever lived was called to reveal the Gentiles the authority of God over Satan. And now he's written a letter to the Ephesian church and he's saying, as a church, as a unit, you are clothed in Christ. The authority of Satan has no authority over you. God is the authority. The very culmination of what Paul was called out to do. And he says this more succinctly in 3.10 when he says that he was called that the church may know, or excuse me, that God, let me just read it, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. It's Ephesians 3.10. Paul's job was to go and plant churches, be a missionary, take the gospel to the Gentiles, because at the core of the gospel is the understanding that we are no longer light, darkness, we are light. At the core of the gospel, we have to understand that we are no longer the, under the authority of Satan and the cosmocrats. We are under the authority of Yahweh. And that we are armored in Him. And that we should, in fact, as Paul says throughout, take this same gospel, he says it throughout his epistles, and go. Go like he did. Share that same gospel. Let the world know that the gospel is freedom from Satan found in Christ, the victor. So our application on this last text is just simply on this last verse, understanding that we are up against things that we cannot see. But we still have the victory. We cannot stand on our own up, stand up to him on our own. It is only in Christ that we can stand against the cosmocrats. And as I've advocated today, I will reiterate again, take your enemy seriously. Take your enemy seriously. 
But understand that God is infinitely more powerful and has secured us in Christ and promised us a victory in the end. We know what's coming. We know where the victory will be. So as I conclude, I want to read you a small quote by Brian Chappell. He says about this text, We are in Him, covered by His blood, robed in His righteousness, members of His household, sons and daughters in union with Him, beloved. We may dread the exposure of our weaknesses and our battle against sin, but the Apostle reminds us that the strength of our relationship with our God is provided by Christ. Because we are in Him, we have access to a power that is greater than we. The power to stand is found in Christ. Think about that. Let's be unified around Christ. Let's be unified in the one piece of armor the unified panoply of armor that we see in Christ. He has given us everything we need as a church body to stand and fight. He's given us everything that we need to be victorious. We are lacking in nothing. Understand that we are lacking in nothing and we can bring nothing to the table. Christ is sufficient for all. Be strong in the Lord and the might of his power. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of understanding today the power that you displayed and the might of raising Christ. The display of power that we see in you resurrecting and bringing him to your own right hand. The power that we get to live in because we are yours. The love that we have on display because we are armored in you. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us to live that out in our lives this week. Help us to apply that to every relationship that we have. Help us to stand firm against our unseen enemies because there is a war. But we know that you will be victorious. And the only way to stand the battles along the way is to stand in Christ and your strength. We glorify you and praise you in your holy name. Amen.